so whilst they 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 are um, they, they do participate on an individual basis as volunteers so often people will be actually uh, sponsored by uh, their employer so the company sometimes uh, academic academia as well so the ultimate aim is to produce uh, open standards known as requests for comments uh, that that is how uh, protocols become standardized ultimately um, there's a lot of processes leading up to that and in fact many um, draft standards never actually uh, make it to an RFC um, or potential draft standards I should say um, but that, that, that that's where ultimately where it, it, it leads so some of these yeah you may be familiar with um, some well-known ones there uh, IPv4 underpins the internet, so TCP IP and IPv4. IPv6, actually, um, this slide is just slightly out of date because IPv6 has only just been officially standardized and that's RFC uh, 8200. Uh, that came out only about a month or two months ago. Um, so it's actually now after 22 years an official standard. It's been only an experimental protocol, <laughs> believe it or not, up until now. Um, but there we go. Um, Email, you'll be familiar, IMAP, BGP, we've already discussed um, th uh, this morning. Um, and then, of course, DNS, DNSSEC, Dane, Web, HTTP, TLS, and, and there's also many, many more. Um, so we're now up to something like uh, 8,400 RFC, something like that. So it's, it's really a lot. Uh, yeah, and that one as well, yeah, of course. And 16, possibly. Um, yeah, so ITF, so it's anybody can participate in the mailing lists and discussions. Um, anybody can submit a, a draft document um, known as an internet draft or um, ID. And in fact, Geordie is a very prolific, sitting there, is a very prolific um, submitter of drafts. He submitted, I think, five at the last... Um, <laughs> oh, 12, yeah, okay. Only 12, yeah. Um, and these get debated um, and discussed in working groups um, and many fall by the wayside but some progress through the standards process to become ultimately become RFCs um, but the primary communication is through email and through the mailing lists and that's where things uh, get get discussed so by the time the meetings come around yeah there's a lot of stuff to be thrashed out already on the mailing list um, last count uh, I may have miscounted but last count was 135 working groups and each working group has two or three co-chairs um, Generally, uh, they have a charter that's defining their purpose and the deliverables that they're planning to produce, and usually a, a time frame. Working groups, in principle, are supposed to be um, fairly short-lived, uh, but some are very long-lived. Um, some are just you know, one year or even two years. Some have gone on for many years um, for various good reasons, but usually they'll have to be rechartered after a certain period if uh, there's you know, useful work to continue doing. So those activities, working groups, and the activities that they undertake are organized into seven areas, and those uh, seven areas each have two or three area directors who have a responsibility to sort of supervise and uh, coordinate um, the activities un under their, uh, in their area. So that's a sort of brief overview of, uh, of, of what the seven, seven areas are. Um, I think applications and um, real time that's the biggest sort of has the most working groups into that in, in that one um, and then there's sort of other areas like the internet area that covers IPv4, IPv6 and DNS the things that underpin the, the functioning of the internet um, and there's also one general area which just has the one working group that's to discuss uh, anything of people like to bring up and again Geordie is one of the very prolific bring anything up on these mailing lists um, so He's been very active recently on that mailing list. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of breakdown of, of really where the working groups are in what particular areas. Um, so the ITF, it meets three times per year. Um, it moves around the world to different locations, um, but primarily, as I've already mentioned, most of the discussions are on, uh, on, on, on mailing lists. Okay, so the last one was in Singapore. It was actually the 100th meeting, um, Reach 100. Um, uh, I guess a, some sort of uh, anniversary. Um, and to give an idea of scale, it had uh, 1,620 on-site participants from around 50 countries. Um, 
But I think there is one important point to make here, is that there was actually only one person from Serbia uh, that was involved or registered, uh, a registered participant um, uh, at the I last ITF. Um, and actually that was remotely, not even on site. So I don't know if that person is in the room, um, but uh, I precisely one. Des wasn't there. Des well, okay, yeah, Des, I think, was registered probably under a different, uh, maybe she wasn't under Serbia, perhaps, I don't know. But, uh, okay, so there's an important point to make there. Um, but, yeah, so um, if you're interested in finding out what happened and um, uh, some of the preview, some of the, the we, we write about, uh, at the, well, in the Deploy360 program, we write uh, about what's happening in, in some of the working groups and particularly the things that are relevant to uh, the Deploy 60 program, so that's sort of IPv6 and DNSSEC, uh, TLS. Um, we we, we sort of do a preview and then we do a review of, of what's happened, so you can read about it at that, uh, at that URL. Our next meeting will be in London, so closer to home um, in March. Um, it's been in London before, it's in London again, um, but remote participation is available, which is Lucky for the one participant in Serbia who did participate in Singapore, but you can go through audio, web conferencing, and, and uh, Jabber. Okay, so these are the, the getting to the point. Um, so ISOC is running uh, an ITF fellowship program, uh, which enables people to uh, uh, attend ITF meetings. And so it's not just uh, uh, providing some travel funding, but we also have a program of events uh, at the ITF meetings, you know, to help orientate people and to introduce uh, uh, people to you know, particular uh, areas that they're interested in. So the sort of mentoring program that it helps sort of take some of the mystery and some of the uh, obscurity out of uh, the IETF. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can um, have look up at this very horrible URL, which I think is still not fixed um, uh, on, the, on the website. but. Um, I think if you go to the slides, you can click on that and it will take you to the right place. Uh, we also have a policy program, um, so fellowships available for regulators to attend ITF meetings and to learn about how the ITF works and how its processes work. So this is really to, to, to improve the understanding um, for government regulators um, to introduce them to uh, you know, the, the, the chairs and to introduce them to uh, how things function, so they sort of have an understanding of, well, this is the way things are done uh, in the internet. So there's a very specific program organized for them um, at each uh, ITF meeting. Okay, but some of the working groups um, uh, that, um, just to highlight, these are not by no means all of the working groups, but these are just the ones that are relevant to uh, Deploy 360 and some of the things that we're interested in. Um, so IPv6, there's, there's sort of probably to highlight three or four groups there. Um, there's two very long running groups, so IPv6 operations, so this is providing operational guidance on deploying and operating IPv6. Um, uh, and again, Geordie, I think you submit loads of drafts to that one, right? Um, you've also got the IPv6 maintenance working group, so that's really the upkeep and advancement of um, IPv6 protocol specifications. Um, so that's again another that those, there's always a meeting of those particular working groups at each ITF um, and has been for a long time. Uh, one new working group is the uh, home networking group. So this is quite an interesting working group because this is developing networking protocols for small residential networks, but it's primarily using IPv6 for obvious reasons. They want to push that, uh, push IPv6 for, for, for that particular use case. Um, there's another group which only meets very occasionally, but it's quite interesting and you know, raises a lot of interest when it does because it's called the, well, it's the sunsetting IPv4. So this is really discussing the transition of IPv4 to IPv6 and how you know, IPv4 can ultimately be deprecated. So occasionally you'll get some uh, proposal to uh, abolish IPv4 or, uh, or, or move it to historical status and then there's some big uproar and uh, lots of discussion about it. So that was quite a an interesting one. Um, on the DNS and DNSSEC activities, um, DNS Ops uh, is a uh, counterpart to V6 Ops, so this is again the operational guidance on DNS um, and how DNS should, should be operated. Um, but then there's um, some specific uh, 
specific DNS groups. Um, one is the Dane working group. So uh, this is really developing um, um, how you can um, develop mechanisms and techniques for to cryptographically secure um, information in the DNS. Um, and this is, so my colleague, Jan, he's, he's got um, uh, written a couple of quite interesting blog posts about how you can actually uh, utilize Dane um, for securing um, mail, uh, mail communication. Uh, and so it's worth having a read of that uh, on our website. Um, one group that's fairly new is Deprive. Um, so this is actually, um, looking at developing encryption for DNS transactions. So at the moment, DNS tra transactions are sent and received in the clear. So uh, essentially, it's, you can, it's possible to trace what sort of websites or what host users are looking up and maybe visiting. Um, Deprive is developing a, 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 a confidentiality encryption mechanism um, for that. Uh, for that uh, purposes, and th that's primarily using um, TLS and DTLS. Um, but there's actually a new working group that's just met for the first time at the last work at, at the last uh, IETF, uh, actually called DAO, um, DNS over HTTPS, um, and that's actually doing a similar thing, but over HTTPS because you know, where TLS and DTLS might not be possible to to to, uh, to use. Um, Routing activities, we already discussed a little, touched upon this a little bit in the Manus presentation, but you've got uh, CIDR. Um, so this is really how you can um, cryptographically secure the routing infrastructure through RPKI and um, quite most more recently BGPSEC. So BGPSEC was, uh, I, I'm not sure it's actually been published as a standard. I think it was very close to becoming an RSC. I can't remember if it's been issued. Yeah, it has been issued, I think, as an RSC just very recently. Um, so BGPSEC is now um, uh, uh, moved to uh, standard. Um, but then following on from that is the CIDR Ops Working Group. So this is really developing operational guidance on how to um, deploy CIDR um, in, in new networks and existing networks. So they've got a, I, I think they've got a test bed in Colombia, I think it is, Renata, the, the academic network in Colombia. They're running a, a, a widespread test bed for, of RPKI and I think maybe BGPSEC as well. So that's actually quite an interesting um, development. A um, couple of other working groups there. They don't always, they cover some IPv6, um, sometimes uh, BGPSEC as well, um, but they're sort of more side agenda items than, than their primary focus. And then, um, okay, so then we have um, trust and identity privacy activities, so developing TLS, um, using TLS and applications. Um, ACME is um, uh, developing the automated certificate management, um, so that's the basis of the Let's Encrypt service, so you can basically get, freely, freely get um, um, uh, uh, X509 certificates for securing your web and other transactions um, through Let's Encrypt and uh, Acme is, uh, is supporting the sort of automated, um, uh, it's an automated protocol to, uh, to retrieve those or to, to order those certificates. Um, so yeah, um, that brings me to really the summary. Um, the IETF is there to make the internet work, the internet work better. Um, it has a fundamental role in how the internet is uh, administered. Um, you know, whilst it's international, it has also has local relevance, um, but it's you know an open and inclusive and well-established structure. And you know, really, we encourage people to, um, well, particularly operators, to um, participate in this process and you know help make the internet a, 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 a better place. Um, if you're interested in any of the things that I've discussed, there's a URL uh, you can go to. Um, and with that, that's with any very short questions. Yes, Geordie. wanted to know, oh there we go um, the IETF fellowships for London um, that the Internet Society has that the call for 
applications is open right now and it closes on December 3rd, so that only gives you a couple more weeks. Um, but that program is open, so I just wanted to make sure everybody knew the, the deadline. You had a question? It's, it's not really a question. Uh, I am a frequent participant in ITF since 2001. Uh, I, I, I want to, to state two quick things. Um, first, uh, it's true that uh, the IPv6 related documents have become uh, STD standards very recently, but uh, I, I think it's, it's necessary to clarify this because may, maybe some people it get confused. Basically, uh, what today is considered a standard is an RFC. We are using many protocols uh, in today networks like MPLS or email protocols which are RFCs and never will get to STD because basically moving from RFC to STD is just an administrative step, basically. There are some technical needs, but basically it's more an, an, an administrative thing and we don't have the time to do that most of the, most of the occasions, okay? That's, that's a very, very quick uh, observation. And the second one is um, taking the opportunity of the people who is here I think what we miss more frequently in, in ITF is the participation from operators. Um, I, am, I am doing training and consultancy on IPv6 mainly, and I hear many things from uh, my customers, and I usually observe myself many situations in networks that never come to ITF because they don't have the time or they are afraid that this is too technical for them. It's not the case. So most of the activities within the operations area, like B6Ops, for example, are the places where you should subscribe to the list and at least pay some attention. You not necessarily need to write a draft, but sometimes we are discussing in ITF among the, the people that, that write the protocols, are we doing this right or wrong? Because unfortunately, most of the operators, most of the participants in ITF are not really operating networks. So sometimes we do things wrong. And even if I say we should do this that way because I know what, what's the problem my customers have, I am alone, okay? Uh, or it's a very small group compared to the majority of the participants in ITF, which is vendors, operating system vendors, uh, routing vendors, and so on. So please do participate, especially in the operations area. Thank you. All right.